All right. I don't want to bury the lead, so before we start building anything, let me address what it is about this particular hidden wireless charging nightstand that makes it future-proof in my opinion, and why I decided to go this route. And I guess there are kind of two things. First is the chargers themselves. In short, I'm pretty sure that whatever chargers we'll be using in two years are going to be better than what we have now. For example, I thought the Apple AirPower mat thing would be out by now, but yeah, that didn't happen. And second are the phones. Actually, let me back up a couple steps. So since this is a nightstand, something that I wanted to incorporate was a positive stop where I could quickly set my phone down, confident that it would be in a spot where it's actually charging without having to look at it. Because let's be honest, first off, my vision is crap already. And when I roll over at 2 a.m. to set my phone on my nightstand, the last thing I wanna have to do is be accurate. So I thought something like this would be a good solution, except that what are the chances that my phone's gonna stay the same shape forever? Probably not too good. So my idea was make a nightstand with a removable plate that I could retrofit or replace as needed as chargers change, phones change, watches change, as life and everything around me changes. Well, other than the rest of this nightstand. That's the only constant in my life. All right, so while I'm breaking down my plywood, let's address the elephant in the room. This isn't the garage that you're used to seeing me work out of. Long story short, I had a really awesome opportunity come along where basically I got a nice little corner of my friend Jason's warehouse space to work out of, and I took it. And this coincided really nicely with the fact that I just went full time with all this YouTube maker business stuff, which is really scary, but also really exciting. And anyway, I don't wanna get super into it here, but I will save a highlighted story on my Instagram where I'll talk about it more. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, just go ahead and head over there and you can check it out. Okay, so in all the shots so far, you've been seeing me break down my plywood into five pieces for the nightstand carcass. And those are the top, bottom, two sides, and a center shelf. And at this point, they're all still a couple of inches oversized. Next, before I took the plywood pieces any further, I wanted to put some strips of hardwood along the front edges of each piece, which is something that you see me do plenty of times. And by the way, I forgot to mention at the top of the video, I'm building this whole thing out of white oak. Anyhow, so like I was saying, nothing really special here, just cut out the strips, glue them, and clamp them on. But I did make this really cool jig for flushing up the edge banding, and I got to try it out for the first time here on camera. And I wish I could remember the guy's name, but this was pointed out to me by somebody over on Instagram, and honestly I loved the idea as soon as I saw it, so I had to try it out. So it's basically a cradle for your fence with another auxiliary fence that doesn't quite sit flat on the table saw. And this allows for a little space that the overhang on your edge banding can run through. So once you got it on there, you just bring it really close to flush with your workpiece and then run them through. And that's it. And honestly, this thing is super fast compared to everything else I tried. So this is a technique that I'm definitely going to use a lot from now on, basically any time that I can. Alright, let's start working on the mevels. Here I'm setting my blade to 42.5 degrees, that's what it would read on the actual table saw scale and then locking the blade down. And the reason for this is I'm gonna make half the cuts vertically and half the cuts horizontally. And this will create a situation where two of the angles will be obtuse and two of them will be acute, each five degrees off from 90. And I actually just made a video where I explained this in a lot more detail. So I'll link that below if you wanna check it out. Whenever I do this, one of the questions that I always get is how do you determine how long each piece should be? So I guess I can kind of cover that aspect here. So the way that I like to do it is I start by cutting my top piece. This one's going to get cut vertically on each edge, so I have the least control over refining the length of it. Once I have that one done, I cut one edge along the top of each side piece, also vertically. And then at that point, I can get rid of the vertical jig and make the rest of the cuts normal with the workpiece flat on the table. So next I'm going to finish off the two side pieces by cutting the bevels along the bottom edges. And here obviously I can use my fence to set whatever length I want. And then I'm going to take the top and the two side pieces and kind of dry fit them together and then take a measurement and use that to determine how long the bottom piece needs to be. And I usually just try to sneak up on the final length by cutting it slightly oversized initially and then just kind of nibbling away with small cuts until it's just right. 
and it usually takes three or four times to nail it. To finish off these pieces, next I ripped them to width, cut a rabbit for the back panel, and then I could glue them up. And for the glue up, I'm just going to be using glue and some blue painter's tape for clamps. And this piece is never going to be subjected to too much weight, so this will be plenty. And also here you'll notice that I'm not actually gluing the top on yet, and instead I'm just kind of placing it here without glue for the sake of clamping the angles correctly. And the reason that I'm not attaching the top here is because there's still a bunch of work that we need to do on it for the wireless charger. So it's just sort of an order of operations thing, I guess. The next step was to add a shelf. So here I'm tilting my blade to five degrees to match the angle of the carcass. And one of the cool things about a shelf in a box like this is there's no need for any kind of joinery. It's just gonna kind of naturally wedge itself in. So let's call it organic joinery. Somebody copyright that for me. Mike? And I did this kind of similarly to how I made the bottom, where I just kind of marked a line on the side piece to show me where the bottom of the shelf should sit to be in the middle, and then kept cutting until it fit right in. All right, so let's set the cabinet aside for a minute now and work on the base. And this is gonna be made of two stretcher pieces and four legs that'll come together like this. Once I had a couple of rough blanks cut to size, I started by cutting a 20 degree angle on the top and the bottom of the piece that'll yield my legs. And this is the angle of the splay of the legs. And basically each of these blanks is gonna end up giving me two legs, which you'll see in a minute. So here I'm marking the taper that I want, which is gonna go from three quarters of an inch at the bottom to two inches at the top. And then I could use my tapering jig to cut them out by matching the lines that I had just marked with the edge of the jig. And you can see here how by rotating the piece 180 degrees, I get two pieces from each blank. And I will say, if you do want to do legs like these, I really do highly recommend this sort of one-two punch jigs from Rockler. If you guys watch my videos, you know that I use them constantly, whether I'm being sponsored by Rockler or not. And it just makes it so much quicker and easier than what I used to do, which involved a bandsaw, joiner, a lot of sanding, and all sorts of stuff that honestly was less accurate and a lot slower. All right, so now I'm gonna set the legs aside for a second and start working on the stretcher pieces. And I did it a little bit different than normal, which I'll get into, but in this shot you can see lots of markings, and those were to help me determine the angle at which I needed to cut the half laps, and then another line that helped me set the blade height to half the width of the pieces. Next I used a dado blade to clear out the material for the first piece, and then I could use that piece to mark out where to cut the second piece. So the thing that I did different here was I just left my stretcher pieces several inches longer than what they needed to be. And that way I didn't need to worry in the prior step about finding the exact center for the half laps. Instead, I could cut them, fit the pieces together, and that would create the center. And then I could measure out an equal distance from that joint, and then in the end everything would be equal. So that's what I'm doing here by marking out the edge of the joinery for the legs. And then I could go ahead and cut all that in.
Okay, now finally we can start working on the top and the wireless charging. So I'm gonna use my X-Carve to cut a base plate out from the top, essentially removing a rectangle with radiused corners from the middle. If you don't have a CNC though, you could basically build this top as a frame to achieve the same effect. After that, I cut out some inserts to fit into the hole that I just made. And I made a few of them so that I could experiment with them. But the awesome thing is, since I have the file saved, I can just cut new ones anytime down the road. So the main things that I wanted to experiment with were charging my phone and my watch. Using the charger that comes with the watch, I messed around with it and it really doesn't work very well through material. So my next idea was to just flush mount it in. Not ideal, but since I can make new plates anytime, good enough. So I'm in this sort of, I don't know, recess and a groove on the underside and the charger could flush mount into that. And this worked, but I just didn't really like it enough to want to integrate it. So I decided to kind of put the watch idea on hold for now and instead just focus on the phone. For the charger, I ordered two of them off Amazon. Each one was about 15 bucks and both worked fine, but I went with the anchor because it has a flat top whereas the Yotech or Utech had a slightly textured ring on top. Plus, their logo's kind of obscene. Shouldn't make fun of people's eyes. It's not nice. The next thing to do was cut out a recess for my phone, which here I'm making out of plywood as a test piece, just to make sure it fit nicely. And once I had confirmed that, I cut another one out of hardwood, which will look a lot nicer when the phone's removed. That said, at the time that I'm recording this, I'm actually using the plywood insert, and that's because I want to keep the hardwood one for version 2. Okay, so here I'm making the recess on the underside for the wireless charger. And there's really no reason that this needs to be pretty, but I already had the X-Carve set up, so I figured I'd just use it. Carve them if you got them, right? Anyhow, I did something wrong with my file, and it left a chunk of material that needed to be removed, so I just did that with my router really quickly. See you guys? I do know how to work with my hands. Okay, so then I inserted my base plate and marked out where I needed to cut out the groove for the top and did that on the table saw. And in that last shot, I was marking it so it was just a little bit bigger than the cord, but thankfully I had the wherewithal to make this groove a few inches wide before I glued on the top, and that way it'll be easier to fit different cords in the channel down the road. Next, off camera, I used some quarter inch plywood scrap to make this sort of public toilet seat shaped piece and glued that onto the underside of my top. And this is what's going to hold the insert plate in. And then finally I could glue on the top. And while I'm assembling everything, I'd like to thank Hedgehog Wood Studios, Nathaniel Duncan, Patricio Rodriguez, Brendan Shaw, Daniel Lowry, Wendy Moskowitz, Sinclair Chi, Trent H, Panos Kofildis, Martin Glennon, and the rest of my Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Like I said, I just went full time with this whole thing and I feel unbelievably grateful for everything that I have. Everybody watching these videos, the support of my family and friends, awesome brands like Rockler, Hikoki, and Woodpeckers who've partnered with me, people like Jason for giving me this new space to work out of, heck, even platforms like YouTube and Instagram for existing and giving me a place to connect with people. I honestly feel like I've been super lucky and I never want to pretend for one second that I'm doing all of this on my own. All that said, the single biggest thing that gave me courage to take this leap is the support of my Patreon members. And I mean that both in terms of finances and encouragement. There's absolutely no way that I could have done this without you. So for giving me a shot at living my dream and for making something so scary a little bit more bearable, I thank you, truly. So there it is, my take on hidden wireless charging furniture, something that could be a trend or could be here for a long time. Who really knows? And I'll be honest, it kind of does feel like a trend, but then so does everything that quickly gains in popularity at some point. Automobiles, fidget spinners, Ricky Martin, the internet. I'm sure all of them seemed like fads to some people as they were first coming about. Some were, and some weren't. 
So where does wireless charging furniture fall within that spectrum? And is this nightstand truly future-proof? I guess only time will tell. And Ricky, I'm still living la vida loca. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe and check out some of my other videos as well. Right, see you in the next one.